So, um, <clears throat> we've been doing a, a four-day prayer condition, uh, praying and preparing for uh, the a- anniversary of um, our founder, Father Moon's, um, uh, the anniversary of his ascension to the spirit world of his death. So, actually, our church term, we use the Korean term, Sungwa, which means ascension, because we don't just die and go into the ground. You know, when we die, we are eternal beings, right? So after we die, we ascend. We do just living in the spiritual realm. So all of us, when we die, we'll have a sunwa ceremony, an ascension celebration ceremony. So uh, in uh, three weeks, we'll be celebrating and remembering uh, the uh, ascension of um, our founder. So uh, we've been doing a uh, prayer condition. I've been praying for the past 40 days, trying to... Uh, just make a good condition in my heart and, and really feel how God wants to move in our church and our community. And um, I kept getting pushed about this new series of sermons that I should be doing, that, that we should do as a, a community. And I kept, oh, well, that's okay. I'll, maybe we'll do it just before the anniversary and, and put it off and put it off. And then finally, just last week, it was kind of like, Wake up! <laughs> you know, sometimes God's like that, right? Says, Come on, wake up! You know, I've told you. How many times have I told you? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I hear every day. I hear it when I pray that I should be doing this. So um, this week we decide we're going to start a new series, um, a series that focuses on our founder uh, uh, and who we call Father Moon, uh, uh, the founder of our church. And um, to do that, to do the kickoff, uh, we have to have a theme song, right? And we have to have a good uh, video promotion, right, for this. Yes. So, let's uh, get ready, cue the lights, and... What we want to do in this series is we're going to uh, go through and explore different aspects of Father Moon's life and what applications that has for us. So here's the advertisement that's going up on the the, the website. Um, And today, you're lucky because to kick it off, we're going to confront the very first issue that, that people are wondering about. Okay, is Reverend Moon the Messiah? Now... You know, at Unification, a lot of times we kind of hedge and haul around that and say, well, yeah, he is, but, you know. So I really want to just, let's be clear. As Unificationists, we clearly believe that Father Moon is the Messiah. Now, the big question is, what does Messiah mean? Because that's where we get into trouble, because people have different definitions or understanding of the Messiah. Uh, Originally, the Messiah meant the anointed one. It's actually a Hebrew term uh, for the Jewish people. Someone who was anointed, and in particular, it referred to a king or a a savior. And in the Jewish tradition, they were really expecting someone like uh, Moses or someone like King David who would come and, you know, Moses with his plagues would smite the Egyptians. And they were expecting that the Messiah would come like that to smite the Romans who were causing so much suffering. Or King David who would be a mighty conqueror who would conquer and, and actually lead the Jewish people to dominate the world. And that's actually the original uh, vision uh, that people had and the expectation that they had for Jesus' coming. Well, as Christians, we know that the most important mission of the Messiah, the reason Jesus Christ came, was to fulfill God's work of salvation, to, to change us from the fallen lineage of, under Satan's dominion and control and to liberate us so that we could really fulfill that original potential God had for us. And after healing us, helping it separate from sin, is to build God's heavenly kingdom. Jesus over and over spoke about the kingdom of heaven is at hand because the purpose of the Messiah is to build that original ideal of God, God's hope. Now, 
There's a couple other things that we, as unificationists, need to clarify about what we believe the Messiah is. Contrary to traditional Christianity, we do not believe that the Messiah is God. Now, that's a bit controversial, I know, and we can agree to disagree, but the idea that Jesus Christ was God came actually 300 years after Jesus' uh, crucifixion. And that's from the Council of Nicaea. And they, actually there was a big debate going on there. You know, well, no, he's not God. He's God's son and representative. Or no, he's God, same one as the creator. And there was this big debate at that, that time. But the one who said that Jesus is God won out in the Council of Nicaea. So this is one important difference because a lot of times if you say to people, oh, I believe that Father Moon is the Messiah, you think, oh, you think he's God? No, no, we don't. No, we don't. But we do believe that the Messiah comes as a unique individual in history and that the Messiah is specially prepared by God. So Jesus, you know, we make the distinction between the mission of the Messiah, Jesus Christ's mission, and other great prophets of God. Uh, we recognize that God was trying to work through the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We believe that God was working through Lao Tzu and Confucius and many philosophers, but they were teachers. The Messiah comes to deal with the problem of sin. Not just to teach us how to live a good life. That's part of it, to teach us. But liberation that comes through our relationship with Christ is different than just learning good things. So that it's an important difference between the Messiah and, <clears throat> and, a, and a teacher. Now, there's two other really important concepts uh, for, in unification tradition that sometimes we need to remind ourselves of. Uh, number one is the accomplishment of God's will. The accomplishment of God's will does not happen automatically. Now, sometimes we think, oh yeah, it must have been God's will. And I know, you know, I've, I've used that expression, oh, it must have been God's will. But we need to think carefully when we say that. Because God's will is only for good. Only for good. The reason that we have evil in this world is not because that's what God wants. It's very important for us to, to uh, stand up for the absolute goodness of God. God is absolutely good and wants only good. So, God's will is accomplished by, has two components. Number one, God's responsibility, which fortunately we can count on that, but it also requires human responsibility. God gives us genuine responsibility, gives us a portion of responsibility that we have to do in our lives. Now, oftentimes, you know, the feeling is, oh, the Messiah is going to come and he's going to take care of everything. <laughs> I'm saved, you know. God's going to take care of it all now. But that's not the way God designed it. God designed us to be partners with God, working together to build a good world. God doesn't control us like robots. So remembering God's will is only accomplished when we have both God's part and our part our portion of responsibility. Uh, Jesus put it this way. You know, this is from the book of Revelation. He says, Behold, I stand at the door of knock and knock. Jesus doesn't break down the door. <laughs> Jesus doesn't force you. Jesus is knocking. Sometimes God can be very insistent in his knock too. <laughs> God perseveres. God is always trying to reach us. But whether we respond or not depends on us. It's our portion of responsibility, our responding to God's call. And this is what God is always hoping for. But the, the history that we see of so many bad things happening, it's not because that was ever God's will. It's because human beings failed their responsibility. Evil in the world is not created by God. It's actually created by human beings. So, the second important point uh, when, we, when we think about this, is what is God's heart? And this is one of the most important uh, understandings that I've received from Father Moon, is understanding the deep heart of God as our loving Heavenly Parent who grieves when the children are suffering. God is not just sitting up on His throne and playing chess with the children. You know, oh, let's see what happens over here. Let's, let's no, God is a loving parent who desperately cares for the children. However, God never takes away our portion of responsibility. God never 
violates that responsibility. God will give us over and over opportunities and chances. We'll put circumstances in front of us. Give us opportunities. But God never takes away our responsibility. And as a result, sometimes God has a hard time. God suffers. I mean, any of you who are parents, you know, when you, when you become a parent, it's very easy, you know. You do everything you can to get your kids to do things that you know are going to be good for them. And when they don't, it's painful. How could God, who is actually the perfect parent, the absolute loving parent, have any kind of a less of a heart? Here's a, a, from uh, Father Moon's words. He says, we must liberate God. God is confined by love. That's an interesting idea, being confined because God loves us. He may well be in prison. He has not been set free. Due to the fall, the ideal world that the all-knowing and almighty God, the creator of the universe, intended to establish based on love was snatched away by Satan. Thus, God could not be liberated in heart. One of the important missions of the Messiah, and this is really uh, understanding that I've received from Father Moon, is the Messiah comes, of course, to deal with the problem of sin and to help us build a, a good world. But the reasons for doing those is because the Messiah wants to liberate God's heart. God wants to be, God needs someone that God can count on. The Messiah comes the one who truly understands God's heart and loves God absolutely and seeks to comfort God's heart by healing the children, by taking care of the children, by investing in the children. So, how about Father Moon? Well, number one, Father Moon is not God. Please be clear. You know, he makes mistakes. He does, you know, he, you know, he goes on the best knowledge he has, he'll go forward, but he is not omnipotent God. He's not, you know, that's not the Messiah. Also, Father Moon is not Jesus. He's not the reincarnation. You know, he's not, you know, we have this story when we look at the um, uh, story of Jesus' life and we look at particularly John the Baptist. You know, those of you who are familiar with John the Baptist, uh, John the Baptist, Jesus said, John the Baptist is Elijah. Now, the reason he said that was because the Old Testament prophecy said, you know, before the Messiah comes, I will send Elijah, you know, and he'll prepare the people. Well, uh, the Jewish people looked around and said, well, you know, your disciples saying you're the Messiah, but where's John the Baptist? Or sorry, where's Elijah? And Jesus says, it's John the Baptist. Now, we know that that's true, that John the Baptist was Elijah. Now, the question is, was John the Baptist the reincarnation of Elijah? No. <laughs> was John the Baptist, did somehow he come down from the heavens on a chariot of fire as Elijah? No. John the Baptist came with the spirit and power of Elijah, but John the Baptist was a different human being. So, with the second coming of Jesus, Jesus said, you know, I have to come again, the mission of the Messiah, there's more to do. Well, the second coming of Elijah was not Elijah, it was John the Baptist. We believe the second coming of Jesus, the person that Jesus called to fulfill this mission was Father Moon, some young man. So Father Moon is called by Jesus and guided and supported. And, and uh, at the age of 15, he received his original calling from, from Jesus. And from that age, he took on this, this mission. Also, the Messiah needs to be prepared by God. You know, uh, sometimes we wonder, what's the personality What's one of the most important characteristics that the Messiah needs to have? Now, some people, well, he must have love, and he must have, you know, kindness. And, but actually, if I think about it, when God sends the Messiah to a world that Satan controls, Satan dominates, you know, the world is out to kill. You know, from Jesus' birth, the world was trying to kill him, right? Always, you know, Satan is trying to kill the Messiah. So what do you think is one of the most important characteristics that the Messiah needs to have? Endurance. Perseverance. Uh, perseverance toughness. <laughs> he needs to persevere in spite of everything. <laughs> needs to be able... And that's, you know, sometimes those kinds of personalities are a little bit tough to deal with, right? <laughs> when someone has really persevered, I'm, has my eye on the goal and perseveres. But the true movers and shakers in history were people who didn't give up 
and despite of incredible difficulties and hardships, they never gave up. Prepared by God, you have to have a certain personality and character to be on to take on this kind of task. So, and Father Moon for me has taught me so much about the heart of God. This is this is for me one of the most important foundations is understanding God's heart. That the Messiah comes to liberate God's heart, and by bringing salvation to the children and building a, a good world where, where the children can know and experience God like God wants. The, the children can have that vital experience of loving relationship with God, their heavenly parent, like God originally intended. But to do that, we have to separate from Satan. And this is a key component of, of salvation uh, that in our relationship with, with Christ and with Messiah. So, how do we... Uh, recognize the Messiah. You know, the, the, there's a lot of uh, uh, ideas and thoughts. And, and for unifications, we spend a lot of energy uh, teaching, you know, trying to get my mind to understand what is God's work, what is God's will. This is why we spend, invest a lot of time in studying divine principle. You know, and I invite you, encourage you to come and join us on our Saturday Divine Principles sessions. We have great uh, study time, uh, discussion, uh, especially a lot of times it's an interfaith group that's, that's discussing. We'll share a couple of points and then we'll explore it from different perspectives. I, I always gain something uh, from, from these meetings and these, these sharings. And, you know, we have a great breakfast there too. So 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock on Saturday mornings uh, right here. But understanding this and even uh, and, and believing and, and thinking, yeah, that makes sense, that's logical, and, and we study about God's providence and how God's worked through history and the mission of the Messiah and God's purpose and vision for each one of us. But to really know if, if Father Moon is the Messiah, this mind stuff is, is useful and helpful, but we need to have our own experience with God. When I first uh, met Unification Church, actually I was 23 years old. I just finished college and I was getting ready to go to graduate school. Um, I'd spent the summer, I was hitchhiking around the country because I, you know, this is the hippie days, okay? We're talking like the early 70s, you know, well, mid-70s, 1977. And I was hitchhiking around the country, you know, I had my long hair and my beard and, you know, and I was playing music on the street corner singing spontaneous songs about the nature of the universe and God's plan for us and, you know, you know, just, I had this vision, I was a prophet of God, you know, God's using me and I'm so happy. So I hitchhiked all around the country, you know, quite a fun time, adventurous time, really feel like I was doing God's will, you know going wherever I got the urge to go, you know, being spontaneous. And then I got all the way to New York and Boston, and in prayer, God said, yeah, go back to California. You know, go back, go back to California. So, there I am, back hitchhiking, I got back to California awfully fast, you know, usually it was kind of meandering away, but I got there pretty quickly, and I uh, started graduate school uh, in family and marriage, uh, marriage and family counseling, and, but still, you know, there, it's like, okay, the psychology stuff is good, and I know that the family is really essential. We need to invest in, in helping the family, but you know, there's just just something missing. You know, because there's no spirituality, no talk about a relationship with God in, in psychology and counseling, and so I, you know, praying, just, you know, what there's there has to be more. You didn't send me back to California just to go to school, you know, where I'm hearing you know these uh, non you know these ideas that you know, they have practical value, but they don't have God in it. And that was when I met members of the Unification Church, and I went and studied. And uh, boy, I tell you, I was really inspired. And, and, and in fact, the, I had all kinds of ideas. Oh, I can use these ideas for my thesis. You know, I was immediately thinking, okay, when I get back to school, I can, I can use this idea, oh, this idea about the, the three different purposes of life and, and the core of the family. And, oh, that was so great. I was, I was all inspired. And then, at the, and, and, and then actually on uh, Sunday morning is when we had an in-depth lecture about the life of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus has been um, very important in my life since um, I was a teenager. Um, you know, I experimented and went all different directions, but always I, I was grateful for, for Jesus Christ's presence in my life and, and, and encouragement and guidance. And when I heard the divine principle understanding about Jesus' life, his incredible sacrifice, and his deep love, I, 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 I wept. 
I, it was, I, it was like I came to understand Jesus like I never understood him before. And, and the, the depth of feeling in my heart for, for who Jesus Christ was. You know, it was before he was like on a pedestal. It's like, oh yeah, Jesus is up there. He's the Messiah. He came, you know, and yeah, he suffered a little bit because that's what he had to do. But no, he was a genuine man who gave everything, every ounce of his love and heart for the sake of God and God's will. And to understand that deeply and prayerfully about that was so profound and important for me. That's probably one of the most important uh, teachings in the unification uh, principle that, uh, that, that shaped my life and touched my heart. But on, on that foundation, though, you know, at the end of the workshop, they said, okay, great. You know, well, what do you think about you? Oh, wonderful. You guys are great. I really learned a lot. Thank you so much. Now I'm going to go write my thesis, go back to school. I can make a lot of money doing this kind of stuff. You know, because I'm going to write a book. This is good stuff. You know, you guys should write a book. You know, I hadn't seen the book before. <laughs> so anyway, I said, well, you know, I think you should probably pray and see what God wants you to do with this. I said, oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I, mean, I, I believe pray. God called me back from from Boston, you know, to, back to California. So I went outside and prayed and said, well, God, yeah, thank you so much. Like, this is really inspiring, you know. And then, you know, thinking about it, just meditating a little bit, and, you know. And I really felt that Jesus come to me and felt uh, God's uh, love. And he said, you know, you traveled around the country. You hitchhiked and, and, you, and you kept saying over and over, yeah, I'm doing this because I'm doing God's will. You know, I want to be God's instrument and I want to change the world. And, you know, so I, I was there with you, and you, and you did all kinds, of, you did some weird things, you know, if you think about it, you know, while you were hitchhiking around. So, but, you know, are you ready to get serious? You know, I really want to see, are you committed? Will you commit to me? Are you ready to give, give your life genuinely? And, and as I prayed and I thought, I said, well, you know, all this time I was going around and I did what felt good. But I never did anything that was difficult. And then I was confronted in that moment. He says, are you really willing to give your life for me? Do you really love me? No, you say it. And your words come very easily. I love God. I love God. But are you really ready to put it on the line to show me? And actually, at that point, I just realized, you know, if I was really committed to bringing about the change that I wanted in the world... I need to be connected with the core of what God was doing today. Not just in my mind or my inspiration, but to get connected. So it was through prayer. Even though intellectually, you know, with my mind I can understand the value of the divine principle. I love the divine principle. So, you know, intellectually and unification thought, the philosophy and application, I love it. It just stimulates my brain. But the truth is, just understanding that there's lots of philosophers and, 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 and teachers that say, yeah, divine principle, very interesting theology, very insightful, useful. But when it comes down to us, what's our relationship with God? And really understanding, is this the place that I should be? Is this what I should be doing? It's not just an intellectual exercise. It's actually an exploration of heart. You know, those of us who have experience with, with uh, uh, Jesus... You know, it's in our conversation, our prayer life with Jesus. You know, our relationship with God, understanding what God's heart and desire and motivation for us is. And if we don't understand God, just really seeking in my conscience, in my original mind, what is God seeking? So, on that foundation of making that decision, interesting things happen. Now, Father Moon, he has coined an, an expression uh, that is a little bit challenging. It's called tribal messiahship. Now, Father Moon says, "Yeah, yeah, God's called me. I believe, you know, I, I, to be the Messiah. That's my mission. But He's also called you." Now I went, "Well, wait a minute, you know." <laughs> okay, I thought, you know, I just joined the ship and everything's fine. You know, all I had to do was sign up and we build the kingdom, right? And that's all, all I had to do. He says, "No, I actually need you to be." a Messiah as well. The Messiah at the level of your tribe and your family and your community. Uh, here's what Father Moon, uh, one way he expresses it. He says, Who are the tribal messiahs? Tribal messiahs are the owners of true love. Now you're going to hear true love over and over and over again in, in unification thought. To become owners of true love was what Jesus, Adam and Eve, and God 
hoped for. Therefore, everyone must be owners of true love and go forward and everything will be accomplished. Tribal messiahship. Okay, so now at this point, you know, those of you who are not uh, Unification Church members or not you know, followers of Father Moon, you know, you can you know kick back a little bit. You can just relax because you know uh, this this is for your you know just for your entertainment. You know, your insight uh, for for members who are those who are followers and, and you know possible insight into what it means to be a follower of of, of, of Reverend Moon. But I want to speak specifically to those of you who have already committed your life um, uh, to God and and, and have committed your life in following the way in the foundation laid by Father Moon. Tribal Messiahship is our life. It's our mission and our calling. Now, there's a couple of things that we need to remember. Number one, even though you are a tribal, a, a tribal Messiah, you are not God. Okay? Sometimes we forget that. You know, we think, oh, I got it all handled. You know, uh, you also are not Jesus. You know, you're not the uh, Reverend Moon. But each one of us, we are unique individuals that have been prepared by God. Each one of us, God has prepared and invested a lot of energy in your personality, in your character, in your skills. And God is looking forward to you using that to the greatest purpose and fulfillment in your life. This is God's hope for each one of us as tribal messiahs. Now also, as tribal messiahs, our number one commitment, the most important thing in our life, is our love relationship with God. This is what motivates us to do difficult conditions to do to fasting to make outrageous offerings to, to, to travel to foreign countries to do all kinds of things it's not because oh you should do that you're going to be punished if you don't no it's because we love God over and over we're asked in our life to show and express our love for God by taking actions in the world by loving the people around us by serving the providence by working to make a difference in the world around us. So as tribal messiahs, let's not forget the core of everything is our love relationship with God. This is our motivation. This is our guidance. Now, we'll get discouraged lots of times. At least, well, maybe not you. I do. <laughs> I get discouraged a lot. You know. And the only thing that I have sometimes to hold on to is, do I love God? But God, it's so hard. But do I love God? Oh, but do I have to? But do I love God? That's the core of everything. The core mission of the Messiah is to liberate and to comfort God's heart. And we do that by uh, sharing salvation, you know, helping other people understand the principle, helping other people find fulfillment in their lives, and also that we, in our daily life, develop habits and practices that bring change and healing in the world around us. Now, you know, we have our ups and downs and we're definitely not perfect. You know, I'd love, you know, we call, yeah, it's a congregation of saints, but, you know, it feels like a congregation of sinners, right? <laughs> Especially, you know, we even, each one of us knows ourselves very well. But the challenge is, is, are we motivated by love? Are we keeping love at the foremost of our heart? Now, we continually need to grow. But that connection with God who loves us desperately, God, that loving heavenly Father, who desperately cares for us and loves us, you know, who Jesus came 2,000 years ago, desperate to bring about healing, you know, to, to lead the Jewish people into, into God's kingdom. And yet the pain that Jesus felt when he was rejected by the chosen people. And even Father Moon, when he came, you know, his life is one filled with rejection, 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 rejection. And yet still persevering because I must comfort God's heart. Even my life is terrible. I have to do with my life what I can to bring comfort to God, our loving Heavenly Parent. So, in practicing a lifestyle of a tribal Messiah, the Messiah level, we need to commit ourselves to these regular practices. We need to daily pray and study. This is, just, this is our food. This is our life. <laughs> this is the core of our life. Daily, we need to invest in that relationship with God. Sincere prayer, quality time, quality prayer, not just thank you for the food, amen, 
but quality time with God, our loving Heavenly Parent, to share about the day, to explore what should I do go forward, to talk about the struggles, to talk about the hopes, to get vision for the future. Quality time with God and also study. We need to study the Scripture. We need to, the Scripture is our food. The Scripture is how we get fed. Now, unless we invest time to get fed, we can starve. You know, we're going to get skinny, not in a healthy way. <laughs> you know, we need to feed ourselves. So daily, just make it routine. You know, I get up, I brush my teeth, and I study. <laughs> right? Just that kind of an automatic routine. It should be our habit and should be our lifestyle. Also, fellowship. We need each other. We are a family. You know, we need each other. You know, sometimes, you know, brothers and sisters, we don't get along. Sometimes we have a hard time, but we are family. And we need each other. And we need to be supportive of each other, to find ways to support. And we need to be willing to receive support and encouragement from each other. So fellowship, finding a way. This is why small groups are so important. Time where we gather, and also why we spend time you know, after church. We'll have a potluck. We'll have you know, time where we can fellowship and, and just hear from each other and smile and laugh with each other, do things together. We need each other to build that bonds of family. Also, we need to put all this into action. It's not just for us. Not just, we don't just come to church so we can feel good on Sunday. Okay, and I did my duty and now I'm done for the week, right? <laughs> no, we need to live a life of service. Why? Oh, because you're supposed to? Because you'll be punished if you won't? No, because a life of service, making a difference in the world around us, that's how we get joy. That's how we really experience God and fulfillment in our lives. When we take the gifts and the amazing things that God has given us and we put them to use, and we make a difference in the world around us. It's so amazing. Right? Just, I, I look out and I think of each one of you, all the different characteristics and personalities that we have. You know, if you just think about our, our community, even in your own family, everyone has different personalities and characteristics. We all have something to offer, something to give. So we need to take these gifts and use them because that otherwise they'll just spoil, they'll rot, they'll get old and bad. So putting them to use is how we find happiness, how we find joy. And God's, what's the great purpose? The, why did God create the universe? I ask this many times. What's the magic word? God created the universe for joy. Because God wanted a loving, joyful experience with God's children. And what is the purpose for our life? Joy through our relationship with God and our relationship with people. Right? Jesus told it clearly. The two great commandments. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your being, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is how we find fulfillment and joy and happiness in our life. And then finally, we need to remember, we have to share. It's not just enough to, oh yeah, I'm saved, I'm good. Thank you, God. (laughs) No. (laughs) We need to invest in other people. Even just share. And that doesn't mean, you know, I'm going to hit them over the head with the scripture, you know, and I'm going to scold them because they're bad and they're wrong. No. It's because I care about people. I want to share something that's given value to my life. I want to share something that can give value to their life. We're committed in this community, in our congregation, to continually growing ourselves spiritually. That means that we need to invest ourselves uh, to grow. But also, we genuinely grow when we share with others. I've heard and even experienced the expression, you know, to become a better teacher, you know, to, to learn something more deeply, you teach it. <laughs> when you become a teacher, it's like, whoa, I understand it even more deeply when I'm forced, when I'm challenged to teach it. So in our lives, let's share the great wealth that, that we have. So, let me uh, uh, conclude with this uh, quote from Father Moon. Father Moon says, On behalf of Jesus, we must purge families of the fallen lineage in this way and realize God's kingdom on earth and in heaven in the realm of the tribal messiahs. That's us working at our family level, in our community, in our neighbors, the people we work with and live with. We must deeply experience Jesus' realm of heart and dissolve Jesus' anguish of dying on the cross and not having been able to have a family. And also the tragedy that the Jewish people that God and Jesus loved so much rejected the chosen one at their time. How much pain did Jesus feel 
for the Jewish people when they rejected him and he knew what their course would be. Jesus loves so deeply. So in our lives, with our lives, we are people that God is looking to, that God is counting on. Now, if you don't know God, if you don't have a a personal experience with with Jesus or with God, and, and maybe you're not even sure if God exists, I encourage you to open your heart and mind to that possibility. And even today, think and reflect on all the amazing things that we have in our life and in this world and in this universe. And I encourage you and invite you to come and spend time to study with us because the most fulfilling experience we can have in our life starts with this foundation of understanding and experiencing a, a living relationship with our Creator, with God. Now, if you're Christian, and on a Christian foundation, please don't accept anything that I say automatically. Please go uh, to God in prayer. Jesus, Jesus is your guide. And, 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 and the most important relationship and foundation that each one of us can have starts with that experience and relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is why I'm here. Now, if Jesus has someplace else for you to be, please be there. <laughs> be where God wants you to be. This is important. And if you're unificationist, if you've already committed yourself to following Reverend Sum Young Moon, please remember our main motivation, the main purpose for all this is our love for God. As we deepen that connection, that experience with God as our loving Heavenly Parent, that's where we'll find the motivation, where we'll find the vision and the hope for the future. Even in this really messed up world. You know, there's terrible things happen in the world. But God never gives up. And God is counting on the people that love Him. God, the people who are committed to God to be the people who can bring healing in this world. So let's look at our lives again more deeply and see, okay, where in my life now can I grow? What's the next step for me in my life? Where am I maybe falling short? Please join me in prayer. Good morning, uh, Father, Mother, God, our, our loving Heavenly Parent, Thank you so much for your your precious love, for the chance that we have to participate in your work uh, at this time in history. We know ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, you have been desperate to bring your children back, to to eliminate Satan's influence in this world and to create that world that your true love can flow freely uh, from parent to child, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives. Heavenly Parent, We're so grateful that we have the the chance to be together as brothers and sisters and for the blessing that we have to, uh, uh, at this time, understanding the principle. We pray, Heavenly Parent, that we can grow in our commitment to you, that our lives will not just be empty words, but they'll be substance, real actions that bring about change and healing. Heavenly Parent, we're so grateful for your work around the world and pray we be, can become active participants in the healing of this world. And most of all, Heavenly Parent, that we can be people that bring you joy, that comfort your heart, and can liberate your suffering. Heavenly Parent, thank you so much. And as a community, and as your sons and daughters, and blessed central families, we offer up this prayer in our time to you. Amen and adieu. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Please uh, take time now and turn to your neighbor and uh, share about uh, uh, your content of the sermon, what you got. God bless you.